One Piece has one of the largest rosters of villains you will find in any manga, partly due to the sheer length of the series, but also largely due to the island-based storytelling structure. Because the protagonists are traveling from island to island, and each island is like its own little bubble, most arcs are largely self-contained narratives, with a completely new setting, new cast of characters, new conflict, and new villain. And with the crew traveling to so many islands over the course of this thousand chapter epic, the Straw Hats have accrued a very, very long list of big bads that they've taken down along the way. However, what's interesting is that despite the fact that most One Piece villains rarely stick around for too long, the vast majority of them tend to leave a strong impression on the reader, such that it's hard to forget even the most minor villains from the start of the series. And part of that comes from some of the very consistent, go-to patterns Oda incorporates when writing his villains, such that the vast majority of them tick off certain boxes that make for highly memorable antagonists. So really with this video, I'm going to break down some of these common patterns, as well as the primary goal Oda seems to have in mind when it comes to creating an antagonist. So to start off, I don't think we've even gotten to One Piece's greatest villains yet. Again, due to the island-to-island -island story structure, most arc villains are simply arc villains. For instance, even though we knew Crocodile was the next major antagonist from Whiskey Peak, his time as the villain was really only during Alabasta. Unlike a lot of other series where villains are often around long enough as villains to become a core part of the story, One Piece villains are generally more temporary obstacles. The few truly long-running villains of the series are still yet to have their arcs as the big bads. And so I think there is some time yet before we get to the antagonists who we could say have the potential to be the main villains of the story. However, if we look at the arc-to-arc -arc villains we've had so far, I think Oda does a remarkably consistent job with creating fresh, impactful antagonists arc after arc, largely because of certain rules he follows. To start with, I think one of the golden rules Oda has is to make sure that each villain has extremely distinct, defining personality traits and quirks such that a villain never feels similar to someone we've faced before. For example, Buggy is comical, insecure, and quick to anger, whereas Don Krieg was brash, naive, and arrogant. Wapple was a pompous, entitled ruler. Crocodile was a ruthless, mafia-esque criminal mastermind. Enel had a deep-seated god complex. Lucci was a cold-blooded killer. Moria was the height of laziness. Doflamingo was a gleeful manipulator who thrived on misfortune. Big Mom is a delusional, overgrown child, and so on. They all have vivid, often extreme personality traits that are unique to them, making them hard to forget. Whereas with many series you may get some throwaway villains or even arc bosses that you may only vaguely remember hundreds of chapters later, in One Piece even a throwaway villain like Foxy is impossible to forget simply because his persona is so over the top. But beyond that basic starting point, Oda's next rule is that the villain's abilities need to further reinforce the villain's character. And with almost every arc villain, we could see the sort of congruence between their powers and who they are. Kiro hid from the marines and laid in wait for five years to execute his plan, which was reflected in his fighting style being the silent step technique. Don Krieg was overconfident and believed himself to be the strongest, which is why he was armed to the teeth with supposedly invincible weapons that were of course nothing of the sort. Wapple was a selfish king who believed everything belonged to him, which is why his ability was literal gluttony where he could eat anything he felt like. Crocodile reveled in seeing Alabasta slowly fall apart and crumble, and of course his ability was literally to dry up and decay whatever he touched. Anel's god complex was perfectly represented in both of his abilities, as lightning is an ability historically ascribed to god, as well as the ability to hear the thoughts of everyone in his realm, basically omnipotence and omniscience. Luchi was a deadly assassin pretending to be a normal citizen, which is of course why his fruit is a leopard, a camouflaged predator. Moria was once an infamous pirate who became lazy and weak after his dreams to become Pirate King were crushed, and so his devil fruit reflects the fact that he is literally a shadow of his former self. Hordy's ideology and hatred for humans aren't based on any personal experience, they're simply handed down from what his predecessors have told him, which is why his powers are similarly not his own. Rather, the energy steroids are an external source of artificial power. Doflamingo is the ultimate puppet master, manipulating the citizens of Dressrosa as well as holding the reins to all the big names in the New World that rely on him for supplies. He's pulling all the strings, which is of course why he has the string fruit. Big Mom is literally a gigantic mom with a crew composed of her 85 children, which is why her devil fruit is similarly the ability to create life. 
So across the board, we have villains with strong, distinct characterization and personality traits that are further reinforced and reflected in their abilities. When a villain's character and abilities are congruent, it tends to make for a more defined character concept in the back of the reader's mind, even if you don't actively think about it much. But even beyond that, Oda also consistently makes the villain provide a strong contrast to the theme of the arc as well. In Orange Town, the focus was on the concept of treasure, and what the true meaning of treasure could be. And of course, Buggy is the most treasure-obsessed pirate to date, which was played up heavily throughout Orange Town, with Buggy not understanding how treasure could possibly be anything besides gold and silver. Sir Village introduced us to Usopp, the man who lies about everything except for the things that truly matter. As we see, he will never back down about who he is, the son of a pirate. Whereas Kiro, who pretends to be a classy butler, has in fact been lying to the entire village this entire time specifically about being a pirate. And so just as having the blood of a pirate is the one thing Usopp won't lie about, the very thing Kiro has been lying about all these years is the fact that he is a pirate. Baratie focused heavily on the power of dreams and ambition, and how that alone gives you a sort of inner strength that can't be quantified, which is exactly why all of Don Krieg's hyped up invincible weapons all paled in comparison to Luffy's simple spear from the heart. Drum Kingdom was largely about the importance of kindness and caring for others, whereas Wapple was the epitome of selfishness. Alabasta centered around the importance of friendship, fighting for the sake of friends and being able to rely on them, which is why Crocodile was so aggressively against the idea of friendship or trusting others, viewing it as the ultimate weakness. While Annie Slobby opened up the idea of questioning the world, recognizing what is right or wrong for oneself, and understanding that dangerous things simply existing is not a sin in itself. Luchu was the blind soldier of the world government who simply believed in dark justice with no exceptions. Thriller Bark was all about putting the spotlight on the Straw Hat crew, and how valuable it is to have capable subordinates, whereas Moria chose to manufacture his subordinates rather than risk getting hurt by losing his comrades again. Dressrosa was largely about the importance of the heart, how that is the key to humanity, but Doflamingo, who was literally perpetually missing the heart seat in his crew, was a truly heartless monster who viewed himself above normal humans. And lastly, whenever he can, Oda attempts to make the villain contrast with Luffy in some new way. Which is really impressive considering Luffy seems like such a deceptively simple character on the surface, yet Oda is regularly able to find new contrasts between his villain and his hero to say something new. With Buggy, as I mentioned earlier, it was their view on treasure. With Kuro, it was Luffy's go-with-the-flow attitude versus Kuro's over-reliance on plans. Don Krieg was Luffy's first competitor to become Pirate King, and was used as a showcase as to what it actually takes to get there, which Don Krieg foolishly believed to be physical weapons and military might, whereas in reality it was guts. With Arlong, we first saw the lengths Luffy was willing to go to for a crew member, which was highlighted by the contrast with Arlong's view that a crewmate is someone inferior to be used, whereas for Luffy a crewmate is someone who he needs to rely on for help because he himself is helpless without his friends. With Wapple, it was his inflated view of what it means to be a king and how that puts him above others, with Luffy instead countering that by introducing the notion that to be a pirate means that any other semblance of authority, be that king or even a god, is meaningless in the face of a pirate. With Crocodile, it was twofold. First, of course, Luffy and Crocodile's drastically differing views on the importance of friends, and beyond that, Crocodile's defeatist attitude towards becoming Pirate King clashing with Luffy's unshakable belief in his dream. Enel, the invincible, self-proclaimed god who finally met his match with Luffy, showed us that Luffy's true purpose in the world is to be God's natural enemy. In Enny's Lobby, Luffy's story arc was about coming into his own as a captain and leader of the crew, which is why for the first time in the series he did not actually fight the opposing party's leader. Rather, Luchi was a mindless soldier who tested Luffy's capabilities as a leader by frequently threatening to go after his crew. Horty blindly hated the humans and attempted to brainwash Fishman Island into seeing humans the same way he did whereas Luffy's open-mindedness and free thinking were on full display as he challenged the people of Fishman Island to think for themselves before deciding who was good or evil. Doflamingo the Puppet Master was all about control and manipulation, which naturally clashed with Luffy as the embodiment of freedom. And lastly, while Big Mom and Luffy were both gluttons, with both of them frequently being greedy when it comes to food, Big Mom's unreasonable tantrums and anger for not getting what she wants were sharply contrasted with Luffy showing that he can in fact show a great deal of willpower and self-control, even in terms of hunger, if it's for the people he cares about. So all that is to say that it's not so easy to think of a wacky new bad guy each time a new arc comes around. There's a lot of thought Oda puts into even, quote unquote, bad villains like Horty, as almost every time Oda writes a new arc with a new villain, there's several levels of thought that go into creating the character. What are their defining personality traits and MO that make them stand out from every other villain so far? How can that be doubled down on by thinking of a unique ability that reinforces their core character? 
How does this villain play into the theme of the arc to add to the subtext of the story? And on a more personal level, how do they contrast with the protagonist in a way we haven't seen before? Making all of these ideas work together each time a new villain is invented is actually a fairly tall order, and just another reason I think Oda is actually underrated, as throughout the series it's actually pretty rare for a villain to not check off most of these boxes. Some villains are certainly more shallow whereas others are more complex, but the foundation behind the concept of each villain is always solid, as Oda sticks to consistent writing principles each time. All of these factors combined make sure that at the very least, the vast majority of villains are memorable, such that it's rare to hear even casual readers forget about enemies from all the way back in East Blue. Now the biggest area where I feel Oda succeeds with his villains is something that seems almost too simple, to the point that it doesn't get the praise it deserves, which is that Oda is amazing at making his villains absolutely hateable. Just making you feel like they are the scum of the earth, to the point that you, the reader, want nothing more than to see someone finally punch them and put them in their place. And this is something that, in my opinion, is an extremely undervalued aspect of writing villains. After all, these days we often heap praise on stories for writing morally grey villains. The idea that the lines between good and evil may be blurred, or that the villain may be in some ways actually sympathetic, or perhaps the villain offers a unique perspective that is strangely compelling to the reader in its own way. And I'm not trying to take anything away from those types of villains, I certainly think in One Piece Blackbeard is set up to be this type of villain down the line, and we've already had Katakuri be a rare exception as a clearly sympathetic antagonist, though not necessarily a villain. However, if we look at what Oda does in One Piece for the vast majority of villains so far, looking at what the norm for the series is, he takes a much more classical approach with his antagonists, where he is generally not trying to paint the villain as a sympathetic figure, he is not trying to imply there's anything morally grey about what they are doing, he is not portraying their philosophies as arguably justifiable. The purpose of the villain in most One Piece arcs is to highlight a philosophy or worldview that is completely and utterly wrong, something that Oda is definitively speaking out against with no grey area. Again, in many stories you are meant to somewhat see the villain's side and understand that even though their actions are ultimately wrong, the situation is not black and white, but in One Piece that is not the goal. The villain's philosophy is meant to be fundamentally and blatantly flawed from the start, oftentimes to an extremely exaggerated degree. You're not supposed to see the villain's side, you're not supposed to ever agree with Enel's delusions, or Arlong's notions of racial superiority, or Wapple's selfishness, or Crocodile's beliefs on friendship. Yes, the villain's philosophy always plays into the themes of the arc, but you're never supposed to see their side, rather you're supposed to see what the blatant flaw in their thinking means for the themes of the arc. Such as how Moria's belief that you should never rely on others only greater supports the message of Thriller Bark being the importance of having a crew that can support you. Now, this is not to say that Oda does not write complex villains, because people's knee-jerk reaction to all this will be that I'm saying Oda writes bad villains. That's not the case. Oda certainly writes complex villains, but a character can be complex without being morally grey or sympathetic. When Oda gives a villain like Doflamingo a backstory, he is doing so to show us why Doflamingo is the way he is today. But Oda is not trying to turn Doflamingo into a sympathetic character, as the entire point was Doflamingo's contrast with Korra's own, who experienced exactly what Doflamingo did, but still came out of it with his humanity intact. Because at the end of the day, Doflamingo is a naturally heartless individual who is missing the innate humanity that Corazon has. There is something fundamentally wrong with individuals like Doflamingo from the start. All his experiences did were make his hatred grow and give it direction. As such, Doflamingo is certainly complex, but we were never meant to see his point of view. At least not during the Dressrosa arc, obviously his speech at Marine Ford is meant to be taken for the truth. But during the Dressrosa arc, the point where he is actually taking on the role of the villain of the story, None of his views are meant to be sympathetic, because at the end of the day we are supposed to absolutely hate this guy with every fibre of our being, we are supposed to want to see someone finally knock him off his pedestal and teach him a lesson. Because really that's where Oda excels in writing bad guys, making them so ridiculously punchable. One Piece villains love being villains, that's the simplest way I can put it. Most of them outright enjoy inflicting cruelty on others and seeing people suffer just for the sake of it. Many of them have tremendously overinflated egos and relish in belittling others, and many of them have such warped philosophies that they believe themselves to be completely and perfectly in the right no matter what atrocities they commit, which is probably the most infuriating trait of all. Not to mention Oda has a knack for writing their dialogue to feel as obnoxious as possible, such that guys like Spandam will really, really get under your skin, and we will then see these types of characters go unpunished or unchallenged for the entire arc only up till the end when Luffy finally gives them what's coming to them. 
And this is where Oda is simply the best. In this category of delivering on maximum satisfaction of seeing a character you absolutely hate finally getting sent flying, because he is just so good at making you hate a fictional character to the point that you are just dying to see someone deck them. So yes, other series may have less cut and dry approaches to the idea of hero and villain. But in One Piece, Oda aims to deliver maximum satisfaction on that simple, cathartic feeling of seeing good defeat evil. In some ways, that straightforward approach can be better, and I'd argue it still has an extremely important, yet undervalued place in storytelling. So all that is to say that One Piece has given us a pretty great rogues gallery over the years. And while I won't say that this series necessarily has the greatest individual villains in the medium, I'd say the best One Piece has to offer is still yet to come and the sheer range and diversity of memorable villains we've already gotten is impressive enough as is. Not to mention the sheer number of cathartic punches we've gotten to experience is arguably unmatched by any other series. If you enjoyed this video then definitely let me know in the comments below, like and subscribe for more content like this, and you can personally help support me making more videos like this through Patreon, with all patrons getting my extended thoughts podcast on this and all future topics. Special thanks to patrons Emmanuel Vargas, Adam Jin Rakai, Neil Patel, Camp Rafto, Kaichi12, God Complex, Hours Blank 13, A. Abazi, Felix Fourcolor, Wisdom Minari, Felix Tengue, Crimson Crystal, Lorenzo Linares, Spike SP, Simon Fines, Jacob Cali, Joe, Sam Penn, Crisis Town, Jeremy Sonpar, Barry, Jordan Hood, Multi 2 Terminator, Mohamed Al Mihari, Lupe, Sachin Goel, Dynanite, Ev Refurbish, Zay Ada, Benjamin Vonstein, Joey Zitka, Odeko, Mirsab Maru. Wakan K, Amy Foster, Conqueror of Muffins, Lucas Gonzalez, Connor, Radden Heger, Raymond Veracruz, Skoro Bagatia, Kanal Didi, Buzz Seven Zilicum, Isopod Shuffle, Jacob Heller, Semicolon Three, Thanks, Pedro Escobar, Mo, Jonah Green, I think the Fire Festival is going to fail, Naji, Mr. G, Shrikar Govindarajula, Mayoi Hachikuji, Alfred Lalfred, Sharon Stevenson, Danieru, I Nistor, Cool Ice, Menage, John Renar Melting, Rain, Ravine, Sir Praligod, Sin 7H37IC, Bean Bean, Charlie Hustle, The Royal Shichibukai, Dice, Agam, Mr. Pike, Andy Tamelli, Rohan Chug, Sriracha Limes, Juan Perret, Ray Easy, Moses Williams, Garrett Clark, Behenor, The Boy 13, Frank Cervantes, Mo Musa, Chris Kresser, Social, Savvy, Jarrett, Amalite 2609, Melanie G, Bartos Zawada, Siddharth Vodnerker, Ryan Garada, Lena, Rob Williams, Wiase, Luis Aguirre, Dark Eternal, Joaquim Torneas, Laura, Vince T, Rohanite, Xeos, Patron, Lun, Michelle Dreyer, Wist, Quick Draw Chev, Lolly Lolly, Ace Goldie, and Brad Matchell.